Thank you very much, Dagmar, for this kind int uh, introduction and uh, Olaf, of course, for inviting me to this place. And uh, I'm happy to present you some of the steps uh, towards decoding the human brain. And uh, I think that the brain and computers have a very close relationship. And uh, this is not a new idea, of course. If you have a look back to Leonardo da Vinci, then we know from Leonardo that he was not only a great artist, but that he also developed a lot of plans for technical systems for some machines. And there is also this image uh, on the left side where you see uh, how he conceptualized the human brain. And I should be honest, this is not one of his strongest uh, achievements. So the brain is not really well described. Uh, it consists only of the ventricles. But still, I mean, uh, he had... Um, he had at least some understanding of what the brain is good for. And at the same time, he also did some plans for perhaps a, a calculator, a, a computing machine, which is shown on the right side. So that means uh, that there is a connection between brain and computer, and the brain is not only an interesting target for research, it is also uh, perhaps more and more becoming an inspiration of new uh, computational systems. Uh, if you think about neuronal networks or if you think about neuromorphic computing or also um, uh, classic uh, computers of high performance. And, uh, such development uh, was in parallel also later on when we think about Hebb's rule, uh, which was very important not only for physiology but beyond uh, what fires together, wires together. And at the same time, the first perceptron has been invented uh, on the basis of knowledge uh, uh, of uh, human brain research. And uh, this development continued until nowadays, and this is only one example uh, where we have generated uh, the first big brain model, a 20 micrometer model of the human brain. On the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, there are computers like the Deep Cluster, uh, which is also funded by the European Commission, and which go towards uh, modular computing, open up this new way. And from my perspective, I'm a user, I'm a neuroscientist, it is very important uh, that we have systems that address the specific needs of the neuroscience research. And they are a little bit different uh, as compared to other research fields. And on the other hand, neuroscientists are not so uh, familiar with using supercomputers and uh, they love to do everything based on their own laptops or at least on a little server in their room. And they are not yet so familiar with using these large systems. So this is really a shift uh, in the way of these people work. So to bring both directions to, together, that is computing, uh, ICT, on the one hand, and neuroscience on the other hand, the HPP started in 2013. Uh, it's a 10-year project indeed, with one billion, uh, whereby 50% uh, comes from the European Commission, 50% uh, from the member states. We are now in the so-called specific grant agreement phase number one. This is a, a two-year phase, uh, where we receive uh, 89 million euros. Uh, for the core project, and the core project means this is a, a collaboration of 116 institutions in 19 countries. So it's embedded, of course, in uh, previous activities like the Blue Brain Project, Brain Skills, Supercomputing and Modeling the Human Brain, Spinnaker Praise, and, and other activities. So it did not start from zero, but this combination, of course, of the partners was new. From SGA1, we have a, a new governance uh, where we responded to criticism in the community, but also uh, from our reviewers. And uh, we have set up now the HPP in a different way. 
and uh, developed, uh, and this is in my view very important, so-called co-design projects where neuroscientists on the one hand and uh, technicians, engineers, computer scientists on the other hand work closely together based on use cases. They develop new tools, uh, new software and new hardware in order to uh, create possibilities that neuroscientists can address their questions using uh, this infrastructure. So the flagship project has a vision. This is understanding the human brain um, as one of the greatest challenges. And we think or we are convinced that modern ICT has brought these goals within our reach. And now, starting with the next year, we would like to um, focus very strongly on the development of a European infrastructure uh, for brain research that aims at bridging the scales of the brain multi-scale organization. What does it mean? Well, the brain is organized on different levels. It starts from the, cellular, uh, from the molecular level, from the gene level, then we come to the cellular level, to small circuits of neurons, then to the mesoscopic level, to the level of brain areas and the whole brain, and finally to large networks, which for instance connect different brain regions to each other. Uh, but we should not forget that the brain is not just an organ, it has a certain periphery, if you think about our bodies, and the brain is also uh, not acting alone. So we are always communicating with other people and this is a very important uh, condition of the work of the human brain. How we want to, how we do want to approach it? Well, by neuroscience method, experiment and theory, of course, but also more and more by a sophisticated inf infrastructure, uh, which provides possibilities for data analytics and simulation. And although it might be trivial that there is this multi-level uh, organization, if you think a little bit more about it, uh, it results really in a huge complexity. So, for example, if we think about uh, molecular simulations, which help us to understand, for instance, the kinetics with which a certain uh, transmitter uh, binds to a receptor type in the human brain, let's say a glutamatergic receptor. This is, of course, very important because these receptors are key molecules for signal transduction and they are also uh, the, uh, the targets for drugs, for instance. However, uh, one and the same transmitter has different receptor types and these receptor types can be topographically located very closely to each other, even within one synaptical density. And every single cell has uh, in the cerebral cortex the full collection of all receptor types for all transmitter receptors. So understanding the kinetics of one receptor type does even not help us to predict uh, the behavior of a single nerve cell. And nerve cells, of course, they form small networks within uh, a smaller region within the cerebral cortex here, for instance, but they are also connected through very long distance connections, uh, which can reach several centimeters. So in order just to understand the connectivity, the way how the different areas of the brain are connected to each other in terms of hardware, we have a, a multi-scale problem. If we have a look at the so-called mesoscopic scale, then we see that all these receptor types, for instance, have a very uh, specific distribution in the human brain. And this is a section through a human brain, and the different colors indicate the concentrations of a certain receptor type. So again, um, there is a way how the cerebral cortex and subcortical nuclei are analyzed. And this specific topography of the brain uh, explains many of the symptoms that we see in patients, for instance, with depressive disorder or in, uh, in patients with multi-system atrophy or Parkinson or, or other disorders. So it is really important to understand the interplay between molecules on the one hand, but also these large-scale organizational principles that we see uh, on the other hand. And, of course, we would also like to understand how does the environment uh, interact uh, with the cells, does, how does it interact with the molecules and the genes at the end. 
So these interactions are again very tricky, but obviously they are relevant. And the brain, this is not uh, uh, a system which does not change, but it changes a lot during aging, for instance, in disease, um, but also uh, on a very small time scale. So this makes a uh, the brain such a complex target of research. And it creates, of course, also a big data problem. Because if we would like to keep uh, in a database information on a subcellular level and at the same time include information of the whole brain on the centimeter scale, then we do have a multi-scale system. And it creates, of course, a lot of data uh, which we have to handle. And this data is, uh, uh, as I said, organized in a very specific way, but also um, finally we have to consider that all these different levels of organization, they vary significantly between individuals, more or less. So in the same way as we differ from each other uh, with respect to color of eyes, or how tall we are, or what our weight is, or our behavior is, the same way the brain differs between each other. And intersubject variability is an important feature, and uh, physicians know this very precisely. So how to approach it uh, scientifically? Well, I started my career uh, to analyze the cellular level of the human brain, more precisely the so-called cellular architecture. What does it mean? Well, this is a microscopical image of the cerebral cortex. So this is the upper four millimeters where the cell bodies of nerve cells are located. And uh, we can see here from this image that all the cell bodies, these are the black label structures, they form a certain pattern. And these patterns differ in dependence on where we are in the brain. So these are two images coming from the visual cortex. So here, the visual input from the retina uh, is arriving, and this is a higher visual area. And you see, um, because we all have uh, uh, embedded uh, pattern recognition, that the pattern is a little bit different. For instance, here we have a lot of very small granular cells, which are absent, obviously, here. How to analyze it? Well, we developed uh, an algorithm where we extract the cell distribution from the surface of the brain to the so-called uh, white matter along these trajectories in order to capture the typical changes of cell packing density from the surface of the brain to the white matter boundary. And uh, one step to do this is to segment cell bodies, as you can see here uh, in this image. If we would do it on a one micrometer level, which is necessary to appreciate the morphology of cells, then we end up with sections of about 20 gigabyte, which is at least a problem for, for many programs, and there is uh, not so much software which allows you to smoothly work on it. And we want to work on it, we want to analyze it. So this, again, is an image coming from the cerebral cortex. This is a surface, the white matter border, and we have here two different areas of the frontal cortex, the so-called area 11 and the area frontal polar number one. And how to compare the architecture of cells? Well, we extract these profiles from the surface to the white matter boundary, so from the surface to the white matter boundary for this area and for that area. And if the architecture is different, then these profiles are also different. How to capture the differences? Well, we calculate the differences between these profiles using a sliding window approach. And at the position where the architecture of cell changes rapidly because it is a border between two cytoarchitectonic areas, we get a peak in a so-called Mahalanobis distance measure, which is a multivariate distance uh, of describing uh, the uh, distances in cytoarchitecture. And this is very important because in contrast to uh, historical studies, which just use the microscope to understand the cellular architecture, we can measure the differences and in a reproducible way can define borders between cytoarchitectonic areas. And this results in a map of a cytoarchitectonic area, uh, 
uh, based on the distribution of uh, cell bodies. And here's an example. This is a section, a horizontal section through a human brain. This is a frontal pole. And as you can see here, at this position precisely, the cytoarchitecture has changes. And using such approach for neighboring sections, we can have uh, maps of the full extent of such areas uh, in a human brain. And if we then compare it with the cellular architecture, then we see indeed at the border there are different measures which change, and these are indicated by these red arrows. So this is the way how we map the human brain. And I can tell you this is very time consuming. To do a map of one or two area uh, costs about one man year or two man years. So one person is busy uh, to map such a region or two regions uh, for more than one year uh, because we also do it not only in one brain, but we do it in 10 brains. And doing it in 10 brains allows us to create maps of the areas uh, which consider intersubject variability. So we map 10 different brains, 3D reconstruct them, and then project them, superimpose them into a common reference space and create so-called probability maps. And these probability maps quantify the probability with which a certain cytoarchitectonic area is present in a certain position in a reference space. And it helps, of course, uh, to do experiments, to interpret, for instance, data from patients, but also to interpret data from functional imaging studies. In Jülich, we develop uh, this particular atlas, uh, the U-Brain Atlas. It is free and available for download for the community. And as you can see here, we have uh, mapped some of the areas of the human brain, but not all of them. So we expect there are about 200 cortical areas, and we have mapped perhaps 70% uh, of these uh, areas. And this is because it's so time-consuming, and we are working already 20 years on, on these methods. But we think to develop such an atlas is highly important because in the living human brain, we cannot address the cytoarchitectonic level of organization and cytoarchitecture has a lot to do with the brain function. Uh, how can we see it? Well, we did here in collaboration with our friends from Stanford a study where we analyzed children and uh, adults in a scanner and analyzed two areas, the fusiform face area and the place area. So these are two areas in the brain which are responsible to recognize faces or places. And the question was, do they uh, develop in the same way um, in, uh, in, uh, in children? And the answer was, no, they don't. Uh, and this microstructural development is correlated with specific uh, increases in the capacity of children to recognize faces. And the development or the dynamics was stronger in the face area as compared to the place area. And this uh, uh, was possible only because we were able to superimpose the data coming from living human subjects from scanning on the one hand and from cytoarchitectonic mapping and analysis on the other hand. So the idea is really to bring together these different modalities that is to bridge the scales in this particular question. Of course, since it is so time-consuming, we would like to be faster and perhaps also have alternative methods. And uh, convolutional neuronal networks are a good way to address the mapping problem in the human brain. And we did some first analysis uh, to use CNNs as tools for cortical mapping. And we have, uh, of course, a gold standard, a ground truth, because we can uh, analyze it also using our uh, traditional methods. So this is a pixel classification in a vervet monkey brain. Uh, then we use the pixel-wise classification uh, based on neural networks, and you see it's quite good, although there is, of course, uh, space to be improved. And um, space to be improved also means uh, to use, for instance, Atlas prior knowledge uh, to inform the neuronal network of where we are in the brain. Because it's obvious that when we are analyzing the occipital lobe, we can expect the visual areas, but we could not expect areas which are, for instance, located and are responsible for language. So to interconnect these different information, uh, hopefully will significantly improve the results of uh, application of these neuronal networks. And this is only 
one of the examples. There are, of course, also challenges which are due to the large uh, sizes of the patches that we analyze and also to the high number of sections. However, even if you are very good and analyze the brain uh, in to do in this very good way, uh, we have to address it in 3D because since the brain has such a folded uh, structure, we always have regions in the brain where we cannot apply a 2D analysis because simply due to tangential sections, we do not cover, for instance, all layers of the cerebral cortex. We need a 3D reconstruction at very high resolution. And the big brain was the first possibility uh, to provide such a 3D reconstruction and uh, to generate a 20 micrometer isotropic reconstruction of a human brain based on a serially stained histological section was an endeavor for 10 years. It was only one terabyte, which is not so big, uh, but 10 years ago, I mean, this was a lot of data. And uh, it resulted... Uh, in the 3D reconstruction, and you can see here, this is the original physical sectioning plane, and these are sectioning planes which are orthogonal and which are virtual. And how to distribute these data? Well, at the beginning, we had three data sets, an orthogonal, and sagittal, and, and horizontal, which were put to the website, and everybody could download the data who was able to download such an amount of data. But if we want to cut it in an oblique way, uh, this is very different, and it is also very challenging. And again, there was no tool available, web-based, uh, which is... Um, which allows you really to work with this uh, large amount of data and appreciate um, the 20 micrometer reconstruction. But uh, now in a, in a very few weeks, we will put it to the website and uh, then there is also a nice uh, viewer making accessible this data set. And this illustrates, I think this slide illustrates where the problems are. So if you have histological sections and you just stack these histological sections to create a first draft volume, you see that it does not really look like a brain. And this is because when we cut the brain, we introduce distortions, and these distortions can have a size of one centimeter approximately while the cells have a size of one micrometer. So this is really an ill post problem that we have to address when we reconstruct uh, the volume. And of course, we would like to go to the cellular resolution of one micrometer. Going to this resolution means at one micrometer that we have 200K uh, by 100K pixel sizes. This is about 20 gigabyte and we process it on a supercomputer, Eureka, and the Jülich Supercomputing Center for segmentation, separation of cells, and uh, it costs us about two to three uh, hours per section, and, and there are about 7,500 sections in one single brain, so just for this uh, one-step segmentation and separation of cells. And... Um, Therefore, we have developed a setup together with a supercomputing center where at the Neuroscience Institute we are doing the image acquisition, visualization and uh, annotation and then at the supercomputing center using Eureka and uh, a fast parallel scalable storage system, uh, we then handle the data. So we ship the data through the supercomputing center and then uh, let them there because it's a lot of data and you do not want to ship them more than once once and you are happy when, when they are at one place. And this, in my view, also interesting. Everybody is talking about cloud computing and that you can exchange uh, Amazon uh, through Amazon, these data. Some data are really not, not good to be uh, uh, used for transport and it's better to keep them locally very closely related uh, to the supercomputers. And in the Human Brain Project, uh, we have now finished uh, the pre-commercial procurement, which ended up in two supercomputers. This is Julia and Euron. You can guess who is Julia. It's easy, of course. Julia is a more beautiful system. However, uh, we use particular Euron because Euron is a GPU-based system and for our, our type of analysis, Euron is more suited. Uh, so there are NVIDIA cards in it and, and we use mainly Euron. 
uh, at the moment. So when we really would like to register two neighboring sections to each other, that means we have to identify corresponding structures. So when we cut the brain, it can happen that one part of the cell is in one section, while the second half of the same cell is in the other section. And now the challenge is to co-register these two sections in such a way that the cells fit to each other. And uh, this is really a very challenging problem, as you can see here. And it is also really a, a time-consuming problem. We use, again, neuronal networks, uh, CRMAs networks, in order to register these two sections to each other. And uh, we use also a, a multi-level approach. So first we start to align larger structure, like vessels, for instance, as you can see here, like landmarks, and then we go to large neurons, and then we can go to smaller neurons. So this is an iterative process which helps us to register these sections and the registration based on manually selected truncated cells. So this is a level where we are. It is much better than if we use only vessel-like structures um, as I sh have shown you here. So there are tons of problems that have to be solved when we want to like to register these sections to each other. So why do we need it? Uh, maybe it's only good for anatomists and supercomputing people. I'm convinced, however, that this has a, a high clinical relevance. And uh, I would like to illustrate it uh, on the example of the subthalamic nucleus. So this is a nucleus which is located in the depths of the brain. Uh, it is relatively small, it's uh, one centimeter perhaps, uh, but it has a central role in uh, uh, regulation of movements. And it is a target for deep brain stimulation in severe patients with Parkinson's disease. So if they do not respond anymore to drugs, uh, sometimes they get deep brain stimulation in the subthalamic nucleus. And of course, the neurosurgeons would like to hit those parts of the, nu uh, of the nucleus that are responsible for motor control. They do not want to hit parts which are more related to the emotional behavior, to the limbic systems. But the question is, where is it? Yeah? So which parts do they have to avoid? And there are surprisingly uh, many models of the subthalamic nucleus uh, from the textbooks uh, based on the cytoarchitecture. You can see here uh, a subdivision into two parts, but you see also the subdivision runs uh, not completely orthogonal, but at least um, it runs uh, in contrary to this. And if you have a connectivity-based subparcellation, uh, there is even a model which looks like a zebra. And I mean, these models contradict to each other, but for the patient, it is, of course, important. So what, what is a ground truth? And you can address this question only when you have a 3D reconstruction based on the cellular uh, structure. And we tried it here for the subthalamic nucleus at one micrometer. We identified the vessels, uh, as I have illustrated. And then we created a stack of histological sections and we used the mark of random field in order to analyze the distribution of cell bodies in this uh, particular volume. And as a result, uh, we got uh, a classification of uh, different compartments of the subthalamic nucleus. And uh, this is shown here on the next slide. So every dot is a cell body, and if you classify them uh, according to uh, their distribution, then we went up with this uh, way how the subthalamic nucleus is uh, parcelated. And this is, of course, completely different from just a pure subdivision into two or three uh, subregions. And uh, it shows also the complex way how the subthalamic nucleus uh, is segregated. As a next step, we would like to integrate this very high resolution of the subthalamic nucleus into the big brain in order to make it available also as a tool for neurosurgeons who are uh, relying their work on stereotactic coordinates. However, cell bodies, this is of course only one side of the medals. Yeah? We would like to understand the connections of the cell bodies. And each cell has approximately 10,000 synapses in the cerebral cortex. And uh, synapses means that there are a lot of fibers, uh, dendrites and axons. 
in the human brain to address these fibers, uh, unfortunately, is very difficult. And in contrast to mouse and other experimental anal uh, animals, um, all these very cool methods like two photon or light sheet imaging, they can be applied not for the whole human brain, uh, but only for a small part. So we have developed, therefore, in our lab a method where we cut hemispheres of a human brain into about 60 micrometer thick sections. We get about uh, 1,500, 3,000 sections for one uh, individual brain. And then we put this brain uh, in a polarizing microscope. And this polarizing microscope has two filter, one here, one here, and a lambda quarter wave. And in between, there is an unstained histological section. And when we now rotate the filter, we can see here, for instance, in the corpus callosum, that the gray level is changing in dependence on the rotation angle of the filters. And we get some sigmoid curve uh, showing uh, how, how, the gray level in, uh, how the gray level is changing. When we go to another region, we get a little bit a different curve. And this different curve or this curve differs with respect to their amplitude and with respect to their phase shift. And using the Jones calculus, we can then calculate directions of fibers, not only within the sectioning plane, but also in the third dimension. So that's the reason why we have relatively thick section. We want to have the third dimension. And, uh, we acquire these images using a macroscopic polarimeter, uh, which is a single shot uh, image with 3,000 pixels with a resolution of about 60 micrometer, resulting in 15 minutes per image and 11 terabyte for one human brain. However, we also have a microscope uh, with a resolution of 1.3, 1.6 micrometer. The scanning time then goes up to 6 to 10 hours per section. And the image size is, of course, quite big with 4 petabyte. Um, and uh, this is, of course, a, a data problem. It's also a time problem because you need one year approximately to, to capture one brain in total. However, again, we need the size and we need this resolution because an axon has approximately a diameter of one micrometer to 15 micrometers. So this is really the spatial resolution that we need. And this is the most that, uh, mic that light imaging can produce. Uh, if you do not want to go to electron microscopic imaging or other optical techniques, which then have the problem that you can only analyze relatively small regions of interest. So we developed quite some workflows uh, based on high performance computing and we use uh, Unicore as a middleware to uh, automatize these different processes and we have huge gains in terms of, um, of, of speed. Um, we try to use uh, GPUs in combination with CPUs to take advantage uh, of their respective power and to adapt all our algorithms and programs um, to do these 3D reconstructions. Uh, 3D reconstruction is still quite challenging because of the large distortions that uh, histological sections undergo when we cut the section. And uh, we have here a B-spline uh, method in order to um, remove this distortion and to create a stack of 3D um, images. At a certain point, however, it's important to have all these histological sections uh, in, in the memory. And, and this is the reason why we, for instance, like very much uh, large memories uh, also in supercomputing, which is not so much necessary in many applications. We do not need it very often and not very long, but at a certain point it is important to bring all these things together and to make uh, the 3D reconstruction happening. What does it mean for uh, 3D PLI? Well, you see here an example of the different images that we capture with 3D PLI, and this is the result image, the so-called fiber orientation map, and each color codes a certain direction of fibers, and black means that uh, the inclination is uh, within the section. So you see here the, um, the richness of fiber crossing uh, in the different parts of the brain 
and uh, we can use different visualization modes uh, as illustrated here for instance uh, to better understand how these different fibers are located and sometimes uh, when we compare with in vivo imaging it it really looks wild yeah so these fibers really have a complex nature and uh, we do not understand at this moment what is the intersubject variability of these fiber connections um, in the human brain. Interestingly, we see in the same unstained uh, section also the cell bodies, and this would make it possible to superimpose both aspects, that is the fiber information from the axonal architecture on the one hand and the cellular architecture on the other. It's really a lot of data, so we try to, um, to develop our methods and test them in smaller brains or in regions of interest. And this is an example coming from a vervet brain. And here we have analyzed uh, the region of the so-called basal ganglia. These are only retardation images. And uh, well, the, the projector is not really, I mean, not really 21st century. So you cannot see many of the details, but uh, if you have a look at um, at a very high level, high quality screen, then you can really see the single fibers and you get an impression uh, of the way how they are running in the human brain or here in the vervet brain. And um, this is very nicely shown here in the 3D reconstruction and it also shows that it is feasible to do a whole brain reconstruction uh, on such uh, spatial resolution. So with respect to polarized light imaging, we are again in a situation that we can on the one hand uh, bridge the gap uh, to more, uh, to higher, oh, I'm sorry, to higher spatial resolution. Um, and this, the yellow one is a light sheet imaging image of a small tissue block uh, that we have also analyzed uh, with our polarized light imaging. I apologize, so it does not come here, but the idea is really to use these very cool, very high resolution methods and then put the volumes that we analyze into this larger volume in order to have this very high resolution at places where we are most interested in, in the spatial resolution. But we can also bridge the gap to diffusion MRI. And this is important because uh, diffusion MRI is a method which allows us to analyze healthy human subjects but also patients. So we can try to use the information based on PLI, for instance, as constraint, if you want to, uh, to calculate tractograms indicating how the fibers are going in the living human brain. So these PLI information, for instance, can form certain constraints because we know from the anatomy that certain connections simply cannot be. And when I go to conferences, I very often see connections from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere, but somewhere in the frontal lobe, where there's no chance for connections to jump over the hemispheres. Yeah, and to exclude such wrong results can be possible when we introduce uh, these, um, these different modalities as priors for tractography, as we can see it here. And these are such tractograms uh, from a living human brain. It comes from our French colleagues at CA. They are analyzing with a very high resolution. This is one millimeter uh, living human subjects and building such connectivity trees as we have, uh, as we can see it here. And uh, I think by combining these two methods, uh, we can get very reliable and very good estimates of how the fibers are located in the human brain. And another important uh, application, in my view, is to do comparative analysis. And this is illustrated here. So this is a human brain. Uh, this is a vervet monkey brain, and this is a red brain. And we have just uh, adapted the size so that they look similar. So the red brain is a little bit smaller than a human brain. But the point I would like to make is that the human brain is not just uh, an, an increased red brain. 
there are quite significant differences in the way the connectivity is arranged from the red brain to the human brain. For, for instance, everything which is colored here, this is a so-called white matter, and the white matter, this is a very small piece uh, in the red brain. And um, such relationships uh, are not only qualitative or not only quantitative, they also imply that there are in principle different ways. But to understand where can we adapt results from the mouse brain or rat brain uh, to inform our models on the living human brain or on the brain organization of the human brain, this is very challenging. And you have to ask this question really regarding each single uh, modality, each single parameter. And uh, we have a lot uh, of information uh, acquired from the rat brain and in particular also from the mouse brain. All the transgenic animals are, of course, very important. But if you see these differences in the connectivity, one has, of course, come to the conclusion uh, that this is uh, functionally relevant and we have to keep it in mind when doing um, uh, conclusions about um, human brain organization. So this is an example uh, of a 3D reconstruction of a vervet a monkey uh, occipital lobe. So this is again the visual cortex and the reconstruction is not yet really good. Uh, the problem is in order just to bring it into the computer, it needs eight hours. Um, it is running on one core, but then we can go into details and this is a primary visual cortex to which we now zoom in. And we can see single vessels, we can see single axons and see the architecture and the connectivity um, on the level of single axons. And this is at least uh, uh, the direction where we would like to go. And I'm very happy that we are in the situation that we are collaborating with our colleagues from the supercomputing center so closely that make uh, such visualizations possible uh, on this microscopical scale. Um, it's a little bit like Google Brain and it's a whole un universe when we have a look to these images. So at the end, we would like to combine the different modalities, the fibers, the cells, the molecules, for instance, through receptor architecture, and bring them into a multi-level, multimodal atlas of the human brain. We have uh, in the Human Brain Project different templates which allow researchers to analyze certain regions, for instance, here in the auditory cortex, which allow them to superimpose their maps uh, regarding fiber bundles or to analyze receptor distribution in a certain region of interest. And everything will be made accessible more and more through uh, the HPP uh, collaboratory and the website. And it is a very long process and I would wish we would have already uh, developed more than now, but, but I think we are really on, on a good way. And uh, we are developing on a very serious and solid basis these tools uh, to make them accessible to the scientific community. So at the end, the neuroinformatics platform is key and a central element of this whole endeavor in the HPP. And uh, it connects uh, simulation, which is uh, an approach to comprehend the emergence of complex system, starting from relatively simple rules like HEPS uh, equation, for instance. But uh, for simulation, we also, of course, need very high computational uh, power and uh, we need uh, a lot of um, um, we need a lot of time uh, on supercomputing however big data analytics also is becoming more and more important where we try to understand complex systems through deviation of relatively simple rules so area a or area b where do they uh, differ for instance from each others and uh, Sometimes these things are very going very closely to each other and I think indeed one of the strengths is to bring uh, simulation and analytics closer to each other, which is one of the uh, um, tasks that we have in the HPP. Where are we now? Well, we have released six different research platforms in 2016. Now we are developing uh, a joint platform. We want to develop uh, a sustainable infrastructure which is uh, available to the science community and uh, consolidate uh, the systems. 
and we would like also to better reflect the demands of the community going beyond the partners that are already now in the project and co-design with new partners uh, this platform. And one of the most important elements is the Phoenix infrastructure. And uh, it is uh, CSCS is one of the major partner developing and driving this process. So I'm happy very much uh, to be today here in Lugano. Thank you for your attention and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thanks for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I learned a lot. Are there any questions? Do we have? Can you repeat it, please? What can you get from in vivo uh, studies, you know, with MRI and what kind of scales that look like this was only on the order of centimeters. Can you get smaller scales with yes. MRI or something? Um, in vivo, we can reach a spatial scale of about one millimeter or a oh, little bit okay. better, which is quite good. And in vivo, of course, we have the advantage that we can see dynamics. Yeah, so we analyze patients or dynamics in, in aging. So that's a big advantage. And uh, while at the microscopical scale, we have about one micrometer. And are these sections done with frozen tissue or uh, when you do histological studies? Uh, well, the cell body stain sections, these are paraffin embedded sections. Okay. While the sections for connectivity, uh, they are formally fixed and then we freeze it down and, and cut it at minus 50 or minus 60 degrees. Okay. So there are different ways. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay. Up there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how does this project relate to Alan's Brain Atlas? Uh, I would assume that you, let's say, combine the data if the license permits that. Uh, I think I don't remember that one could uh, have the possibility to rotate the brain uh, in the software uh, offered at the Alan's Brain website. So that's probably one of those differences. So mm -hmm. can you comment on that? And especially those, uh, one could actually see which genes are expressed in which cells in mm -hmm. the Allen's brain mm -hmm. atlas. So I think what is very, I would say, missing in, uh, in your model. So could you mm -hmm. comment on this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are different brain initiatives worldwide. So in China, there is a very strong initiative. Uh, the Seattle Institute is very strong. We are collaborating with them. And the idea is precisely what you said. So, so bring in the knowledge uh, that goes beyond my own lab, for instance. And in fact, uh, with Michael Hovlewitz, we have developed uh, a tool uh, which relates gene expression pattern from the human brain uh, to the cytoarchitectonic maps. So the idea is that we really achieve uh, a status where the different global brain initiatives identify their links, uh, identify the neuroinformatics tools of how to exchange the data and take advantage of the different strengths. So while the, the Allen Brain Institute is very good in gene expression data, they do not have any maps and also not so much connectivity and also not high resolution. They have the genes here. Yeah? Uh, while other initiatives, uh, for instance, the Human Connectome Project has a lot of uh, data relating to uh, DTI-based connectivity. So in my view, the, the brain is simply too big as to approach it from one lab or even one country, and we really here have to collaborate, which is of course a tricky thing, but, but I'm, I'm optimistic that we can define it and, and collaborate further. Any further questions? Otherwise, I would have one more question. Like in, in terms of medical use, so if you think of autism or whatever, like in autism, brains are enlarged. 
um, but people will only be able to use MRI. Would your resource be useful in mapping the areas that are enlarged, even if it's just small differences? And what do you see in terms of collaboration with medics? Because you have like huge data sets, would it even be accessible to those people who study uh, patients? So one direct uh, application would be that we connect our databases to existing large databases, for instance, like ADNI. So ADNI is very well known for neurodegenerative disorders, uh, but there are other databases as well, including also those from autistic children or adults and so on and so forth. So we develop, for instance, high throughput uh, imaging uh, analysis workflows in order to analyze such data and then uh, compare these data from MRI with maps, with receptor distribution, with connectivity or with gene expression data. This would be one possibility and this is high throughput imaging as we call it for neuroimaging data. Uh, to analyze brains of patients uh, post-mortem is possible, and I did it in the past, and we also did it for certain diseases like multi-system atrophy. Um, but the, the problem is always that patients are very special and unique. Yeah, and, and when they die at the end, I mean, they have a long history uh, of how their brain was changing of drugs uh, that were administered during the whole lifetime. And this increases, of course, the variability. Uh, so while I'm convinced that we have to do such questions, to do it on a whole brain approach is, is simply not feasible in, in many cases. So we have to go to animal models or have a look to regions of interest, which, which is what we do uh, practically. Thank you very much. Any further pressing questions? There's one. Thank you very much, very nice, interesting presentation. My question is related to the first part of your talk when you mentioned about a molecular interaction, so the atomistic models, the scale of interaction. My question is, uh, do you have any idea how to go beyond this resolution, increase your resolution, your mapping, also to involve protein, protein interactions or uh, other interactions that may play a role in uh, developing a model of the brain? Beyond resolution, you mean towards more molecular to nanometers, scale? Nanometers, to nanometers, so having stronger resolution to try to implement this data? Well, I mean, there are, of course, possibilities to similar these interactions. Uh, there are molecular simulations, which my colleague Paolo Carloni is doing, but you can also do uh, QM simulations here. Yeah? Uh, the question is how to, how to connect this, this knowledge. I mean, if you are already happy, if you have one atom, yeah, what does it mean for, for brain function at the end? So, so really to solve this question, I think this, this is the endeavor. So in principle, yes, there are certain people uh, working very much in this direction and, and we have very prominent representatives here in the room. Um, on the other hand, really to link it is, is not, it's not, so, it's not so easy. One possibility is really to have the kinetics, for instance, of a drug ligand uh, inter or drug receptor interaction, and, and then go to experimental animals and, and see the expression of the receptors in this animal or, or do some physiological research. So this is possible, but when it goes even lower, then um, I do not know many approaches which would help us to scale it up. Okay, now my question was if you are trying to, or it's in the plan to go uh, at least nanometers and then to go also to higher resolution. So it's, but you answer, I mean, the effort is there. I mean, yeah, the, okay. the effort is there. To bridge it, to, to link it, easy. this is the difficult thing. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Otherwise, let's thank our speaker again and uh, break for lunch.